Thank you. Thank you very much. And good morning to you all. It is a great pleasure to be here again in the European Parliament. It's a pleasure that my good friend Jimenez Barbat uh, has uh, remembered me, yeah? this poor uh, countryside Spaniard. And I'm going to talk about uh, identity. And we've already heard very interesting things about identity. I think the topic was well chosen by our MEP. It is a very relevant question today. I believe that uh, it allows us to uh, find arguments to uh, find the, 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 the right concept of uh, identity, uh, a topic that has been used by neo-nationalists. We all know the book by Amin Malouf, Les Identités Meurtrières, which is an essential reading to uh, analyze this uh, topic, especially today. Uh, because nationalists are uh, again using that argument of identity. We need to distinguish between traditional nationalisms uh, that uh, emerged in the 19th century and they were uh, liberating nationalism and movements that they had to do with the Romanticism, like in Germany, for instance, and that helped uh, in the creation of Germany towards the end of uh, the 19th century. I'm also thinking about the Italian nationalism that uh, gave birth to Italy. So those nationalisms had to do with freedom, with uh, access to culture uh, without borders. Had to do with novelty and uh, and and, and em embracing uh, the new, and let's remember that the Pope was still fighting against modernity back then, and and let us not forget that Gregory the Sixteenth and Pio Nono were forbidden even the train, the railway. They said, we don't need uh, a train in the Vatican because we don't want new ideas to come here by train. Eh? Mainly the ideas coming from France. So neo-nationalism has nothing to do with that uh, uh, nationalism of the 19th century. Current nationalism has to do with fear. Fear of the future, fear of globalization, uh, fear of what is different. And this is leading to a blind alley. This reminds me of what happened in the first, third, first half of the 19th century when uh, the bourgeoisie was taking shelter in their homes. They were basically a hold up there. They were, uh, well, they turned to music, uh, the Wiedermeyer in, in Central Europe. And that was very disruptive. And this was in the context of all these novelties that were emerging and that were being uh, fought. So this is a little bit the same context today, this new nationalism that is taking hold in countries like France or Germany or, or here in Belgium, this country. And this is what I believe that has to be uh, combated and what we're doing today is, is, is that, uh, reflecting on that. So this neo-nationalism, as I say, uh, uses the, the flag of identity, yeah? like that kind of tribe uh, uh, shout. You, you, the, we are different, an altar to the difference and, and, and to what is particular, not to what unites us, as Arsuag was saying earlier on. Uh, it's, it's the difference what matters. And in Spain, we, 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 we are familiar with that. This was used to uh, we've used concepts like historical rights, for instance, and they are enshrined in the Spanish Constitution. Those historical rights uh, come from where? From God, because the, nobody knows where they come from and when they will end. 
they are absolutely eternal. So those uh, historical rights can be found in other constitutions. Uh, the Bismarck uh, uh, Constitution of uh, 1871, uh, well, and Bismarck was doing that to try to attract uh, southern regions in Germany to, 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 to the concept of Germany. They were called kind of uh, reserved or exclusive rights. They called them differently, but it's more or less the same. And then with the Weimar Constitution, the progressive forces that uh, draft that constitution, and the socialists and the liberals, let's remember that, they eliminate those historical rights that were invented uh, by Bismarck. And that is uh, interesting because I was reading again uh, some discourse, discourses, speeches of uh, Antonio Maura, and the Spanish participants here will remember him, his great-grandfather of Jiménez Barbat, hmm, who is here with us. He, with Canalejas, were the two only people that were uh, wise enough during the reign of Alfonso uh, XIII. Um, and Maura, uh, that thinker, uh, says, uh, and back then he wasn't referring to identity because then the word was personality. He addresses the members of parliament and he says, well, this, this thing about personality, this question, that is not a statement, it is a question because it's more or less like saying what for to what purpose do you want that identity what is the the purpose of having that identity and that was what don antonio maura said uh, when dealing with the catalan problem at the beginning of the 20th century so this is really nothing new then uh, identity uh, uh, used by 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 tribes as the logo of the tribe and also emotions, feelings, feelings. Uh, they're absolutely legitimate, of course. We all have different emotions. We love our parents. We love uh, our homeland, the, the, the local uh, celebrations, and, and so on and so forth. But what we cannot do, what we cannot afford to do, is to build political structures on emotional foundations. So okay, so you you bring this, uh, you know a group of stones from one place to another, and then that should give rise to an independent state with constitutions and and, and ambassadors. That is absolutely preposterous, and that's what happens. Identities want to build political structures. So how can we leave behind that notion of identity? Well, building values, cultivating, cultivating values, and when I, uh, when I hear values, I, 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 I understand nothing really. Uh, law experts, uh, we are deficient in many ways, but we have also certain virtues, which is we want to be accurate, we want to be thorough. So when people say values, what do they mean? values, European values, the values that identify us as Europeans are those that have been enshrined in treaties that are contained in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of 2000, in the Nice Charter of Fundamental Rights. So those rights uh, update that, that other chart that was uh, written uh, during the French Revolution and, and then later by the United Nations is like the vata mechum for, uh, for us. They, they uh, represent and enshrine all our values. And this is important to remember because that Charter of Fundamental Rights of 2000 has been included uh, through the Article Number 6 of our treaty uh, to, to, the, to the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And the EU, uh, as such, uh, is true that they've not really adhered uh, the, 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 the Charter. There is a controversy at the moment. Everything is, uh, again, uh, 
well paralyzed because the 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 court in Luxembourg, and of course, why? Well, countries like Romania and others are are complaining. Anyway, the EU has not adhered uh, to the to the Charter of Fundamental Rights. But this uh, should be no obstacle for insisting that the Charter is already included uh, by means of that Article 6. And we have values, values that are clearly defined, not just words. So those values have been legally expressed in a legal text. Now, I agree that uh, culture and others said it earlier, uh, the, the two speakers that spoke before me said it, culture is our common identity trait that helps us uh, recognize each other. When I was a member of this parliament, I made a proposal and obviously nobody listened to me, but I'll, I'll say it again, why not? I think it was an interesting proposal I said that we should enumerate and uh, make a list of 50 celebrities, uh, people that, that, that are already dead and, and buried, at least physically. Mm, uh, they might have left uh, heritage, but they are, they're dead. And they have nothing to do with politics. They're not partisans uh, to anything. They're just creators. And we should have some sort of survey among citizens so that all uh, Europeans, uh, the citizens that want to take part in that, they, they could write down who their cultural references are, excluding the cultural references coming from their own country. For instance, Spaniards could not say Goya or Cervantes. Right? We would have to exclude uh, our own cultural references. And, uh, and then we could select people like Mozart, Cervantes, would have those uh, great figures of, of the world of arts. And uh, then we would uh, uh, create a narrative that we could uh, spread to schools, universities. And today, thanks to, to, to the internet, it is very easy to create that narrative of those 50 celebrities. We could uh, write a biography. And, 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 and try to summarize the, the, their contribution to, to culture. And the history of, of culture and uh, history, to court, as the French say, that has been marked by uh, bloody fights and uh, we have also had uh, moments and, and, and phases in, 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 in Europe where there was great solidarity. So we would like to create that uh, past, that common past, without falsifying anything or distorting anything and insisting on the common cultural past. Nobody can deny that we've all been influenced by Verdi or Mozart or by the literature of Moliere, his plays. You can be very thick, but uh, nobody will deny that Rubens uh, uh, made a contribution to our culture. So Europe, and now let's, let's focus on, on those materials that uh, have given the title to my uh, speech. So those are the materials that I would use, that common cultural past. Also those values that uh, are enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights that have been defined legally and they should be a source of pride for Europeans. And then uh, thirdly, and, and also very important, we should uh, highlight our common interests. 
I mean, if you if you if you live in a building in a flat, uh, you you share a common interest with your neighbors. You want the lift to work. You want uh, rubbish to be collected. So, what are our common interests as Europeans? Quality of life, uh, fiscal policy, harmonize at a European level, uh, discipline for banks and investment banks, and so on and so forth. We do have common interests. So if we add that to our uh, values and the common past culture, um, we will just have created Europe. It's not as difficult as that, really. And uh, however, we know that Europe is not a nation and it doesn't have to be a nation. It is not necessary. That would be more of a nationalist approach again. We don't have to be so exclusive. We don't need fights, battles or blood. The epic has been replaced by a soft lyricism that is contained here in the European Parliament and also in the uh, rulings of the European courts, in our directives and regulations and that will elicit different emotions in different people according to to who they are and i believe that this will uh give rise to to a, a very fertile idea of european citizenship and let's remember that in the roman empire attaining uh, citizenship uh, was was a huge quest uh, it wasn't until year uh, 212, uh, it was Emperor Caracalla, that's how we, we know him, Caracalla, at least in Spanish, and he uh, said, okay, all uh, inhabitants of the empire are citizens, so there is no difference between the governors and those that are uh, governed. Uh, colonizers and those that have been colonized so that changed the entire perspective it changed the 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 debate about who was a citizen and who wasn't slaves went uh, those that had been freed weren't citizens either or not straight away but then in that year 212 the emperor uh, abolished that system of course, uh, it is an interesting example to remember, uh, to, to remember how the concept of citizenship evolved uh, in those seven and eight centuries in the, in the Roman Empire. And I think I've almost concluded. Um, I would like to quote And I think the, the, this could be helpful for, for our debate here today and for many others. Picteto. Uh, I, I saw those words in a book that I was written by Helmut Schmidt. The last book written by Helmut Schmidt when he was uh, 90 years old or, or, or older. And the, the title was something like What I Still Have to Say or What I Still Want to Say roughly translated from the German. And Helmut Schmidt, who was very important in his day and age, uh, concludes by remembering Epicteto, saying, give me the serenity, give me the serenity to tolerate those things that I cannot change. Give me courage to change what I can really change and give me wisdom to be able to distinguish both. Thank you.